Um, few notices. Uh, firstly, we had the Amy conference. Um, Amy is the network which we belong to, and Lindsay, and myself, uh, went to that. John was hoping to come, but so the train companies were fearful of the snow, so lots of, lots of them were cancelled. Um, it was the biggest conference yet, so we had around 100 of us there, including some from the Church of England backgrounds who were thinking, uh, what next? Um, good Bible teaching, good seminars. Uh, do come and chat to Lindsay and I if you want to know more about what we learned there. Plans for this week, uh, it's, a, it's a regular week at Hope Church, so we've got um, our Monday morning prayer meeting on Zoom, so 9 o'clock if you want to join us. Um, we've got toddlers on Tuesday morning, and then midweek groups as usual on Wednesday and Thursday. And finally, uh, nominations for church council and also the lay synod rep, which I'll say more about. So, so far we have received <laughs> three nominations for church council, which is a good start. Um, so that'll be the new council will start after the AGM, so basically from May 2023. Um, there are two council members who are automatically appointed, so that's me as the senior minister, and then one of the Walkergate we'll Trust trustees, the trustees will discuss and appoint someone, plus the three, so that makes five. Um, we need a minimum t team of six, we can certainly have more than that, and that'd be great, but we need a minimum of six. So uh, keep praying for the Lord to provide, and if there's anyone else that you'd like to nominate, again, have a conversation with them, and uh, if they're in agreement, then you can uh, find a seconder and pass uh, the nominations to Helen. And we've got until the end of March to, to do that. Uh, I've also discovered that we need to elect a lay synod rep. <laughs> So we'll put that into the mix. Uh, what's that? That basically someone who represents Hope Church at the Amy Synod. What's the Synod? <laughs> That's a sort of once a year gathering when all the Amy churches gather together to make decisions about the future and Amy and how we're governed, how we're organised. Um, so it's an important meeting. We meet once a year in Sheffield. And the, the role involves uh, quite a lot of reading and preparation for that meeting. Uh, going to Sheffield for the day. Uh, and actually not too much after that, I think, <laughs> unless you've got a sort of subcommittee or something. Um, Julie kind of did that for us last year, uh, just uh, getting us started. But from this year onwards, the rep must be elected by the church family. Um, the elected lay rep, synod rep, will serve a three-year term. Um, so if you're a church member, you'd like to nominate someone, again, the same process as the um, church council, um, nomination, seconding, and pass uh, any nominations to heaven. Have I missed anything? <laughs> Shrug of the shoulders, and, and some, uh, yeah. I think we're ready to start then, good. Uh, let, let's start by prayer. Um, we're gonna use a prayer based on Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24. And let's pray this as our opening prayer together. Lord God, as we meet together this morning, please search us and know our hearts. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. See if there are any offensive ways in us and lead us in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're going to sing a song together now. It's based on the traditional Christian creeds that we often stand and say together, the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, but this um, song puts the creeds to music. Um, we did sing this once or twice at St Oswald, so you might be familiar, but if not, um, sing along when you feel ready to. Uh, let's stand and sing. <coughs>
Well, we've just been singing of our God and who he is and what he's like. And it's right as we come to him to remember our sin, that we are not like him. And to confess the ways in which we fall short of um, the way he would want us to live. So let me now lead us in a time of confession to our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you that you made the world. And we confess that we so easily focus all our attention on the good things that you have created, like family, friends, holidays, technology, the, the natural world, or sport. And we forget to give you the glory as the God who made all of these things for us to enjoy. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came to earth to die on the cross to save us from hell. But we confess that we often stop there in our thoughts of you. We do not honour you and love you and revere you as the risen, ascended Jesus, the one who will return to judge us and everyone in the world. So forgive us for being slow to listen to your word and for not living as people who must give an account to you of our lives when you return. Amen. Amen. Holy Spirit, thank you for inspiring every word of the Bible. And thank you for pointing us to Jesus, our Saviour. Forgive us for often ignoring you and your powerful ministry on earth. Forgive us for our self-reliance in church life and for our dependence on our human resources and programs, rather than asking you to give us the boldness, the wisdom, and the opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with others. Amen. 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 Well, if we're trusting in Jesus Christ, we mourn over our sin. It grieves us. But we must never despair about our sin. Because Jesus Christ has paid in full for all of our sin, once and for all, by his death on the cross 2,000 years ago. And so if we're trusting in Jesus Christ this morning, we can rejoice, as David did, in the words of Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And Lindsay is now going to come up and tell us more about the wonder of that as she explains our next big word, which ends in shun, <coughs> justification. Okay, so we're going to the courtroom today for today's big word that ends in shun because justification is a legal word. So what does justification mean? In Colin's song that we're doing, the big words that ended a show from, justification is just like we never sinned. And some people find it um, really helpful to remember what justified means. They say it's just as if I'd never sinned. So just as if I'd never sinned. And Matthew told us last week that sin is saying no to God. And so to be justified is just as if I'd never said no to God. And if we were being accused in court, the judge would declare us not guilty or innocent. And in the Bible, God talks about a judgment day when he will be the judge of all people. But justification is even more than being found innocent. I want you to imagine that you or I are in court charged with driving dangerously. For some of us, that's not so hard to imagine. Um, if we were justified by the judge, if he declared us justified, he would say that we hadn't been driving dangerously, but also that we had always driven perfectly never gone through an orange light that was about to turn red, never gone over the speed limit even just a tiny bit, always been kind and patient to other drivers, never showing any signs of road rage. The judge would be saying, we're such good drivers, we should be teaching everybody else to drive just like us. So justification means 
we haven't broken the law, and we have also perfectly kept the law, like Jesus did. So a better definition of justification is to be declared righteous. Now, I've replaced one big word with two more big words that don't end in shun. So Izzy's going to help me with this bit. wearing a white t-shirt. What does it say? Righteous. Izzy says it says righteous. So righteous is another word for perfectly good. So every time we look at Izzy, we see her as righteous. So she is fully <laughs> righteous now. <laughs> the words on her t-shirt aren't blurry or indistinct or getting there or appearing gradually. As soon as she put on her t-shirt, we can see that she is righteous. And so it is with us and God. When we are declared righteous, he sees us as perfect, as if he was looking at Jesus. We are not seen as a work in progress. When we're justified, it's a status, it's a label that he gives us, a right standing before God that we enjoy now. It's permanent and it's eternal. In this book, Warren Bershey says, once God has declared us righteous, the sin question is settled once and for all. So, Izzy, what did you have to do to get your t-shirt? Were you extremely good, and did you do everything that your parents told you to do straight away? <laughs> no, you didn't help with your brothers or keep your room clean for a week? No. No? Okay, maybe you bought the t-shirt. Did you pay for it? No. No? So how did you get the t-shirt? Um, I gave it to you. <laughs> Justification isn't something that we can earn. God is not rewarding us for our efforts and no amount of good works will ever make us righteous before God. In this verse it says that God makes people right with himself, which means that he justifies them, through their faith in Jesus Christ. This is true for all who believe in Christ. Everyone who has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard and all need to be made right with God or justified by his grace, which is a free gift. Justification is a gift. When we see the word grace, we know that it's unearned and undeserved. If God gave us what we actually deserved, this is the t-shirt that Izzy would have been wearing today, that we all deserve to wear. As it says in that verse, everyone has sinned and has fallen short of God's glorious standard. But hang on, if God is good and perfectly just, how can he declare that sinners are righteous? Does he overlook our sin? Does he just close his eyes and try and ignore it? Does he just let it go? No, if he did that, he wouldn't be a just God, would he? Romans 5 verse 9 says, We've been made right with God by the blood of Christ's death. Jesus took the punishment that we deserve for our sin. And when we do substitution, another word that ends in shun, you'll get some more about that. But just for now, at the cross, justice is done. And how are we given this righteous title? How can we accept the gift? How do we get to wear the t-shirt? Did you catch that from our previous verse? God makes people right with himself through their faith in Jesus Christ. This is true for all who believe. If we put our faith in God, he will declare us righteous. We only need to believe in Jesus' death and resurrection to be justified. So that's justification, being declared righteous. By grace, not merit. By faith, not works. And by the blood of Jesus. So let's pray. <coughs>
loving Father God, we thank you for justifying us, for declaring us righteous, by pouring out the punishment for our sin onto Jesus. Thank you for this precious gift of righteousness that we can have when we put our faith in him. Help us to, tr help us to stop trying to earn it by good works and deeds. Help us instead to tell others about it so that they too can also enjoy being in right standing before you. For your glory. Amen. Amen. And now as the children depart, we'll sing before the throne of God above. The whole song brilliantly describes justification, but look out especially for the words that say, Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect, spotless righteousness. <laughs> saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. <coughs> and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will, wipe, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Pray. 
Almighty God, we praise you for the wonderful world that you have created. We marvel at the beauty and intricacy of your works. We thank you for your provision for us, for our homes, families, friends, food, clothing, shelter, and many other blessings. Above all, we thank you for your amazing plan of salvation, which came to fruition through the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for bringing us to faith in him and accepting us into your family. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit to encourage us in our faith and to teach us to grow more like Jesus. Amen. Amen. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the fellowship we enjoy with our link missionaries, Chris and Rosie Redfern, Chris and Sarah Keeler. We pray for these two young families who are focused on serving you in Valencia and Spain and Northern Ireland, respectively. We thank you that Chris and Rosie have seen encouragement in the church recently, and we pray that the youth club would continue to grow and that the church in general would develop a real desire to grow spiritually. For Chris and Sarah, we pray that their time in Northern Ireland would be well used and that they would, you would direct their path regarding their return to Thailand. In the meantime, we ask for your mercy and wisdom as they negotiate the time for Miriam to receive her cochlear implants. Please grant Miriam much improved hearing and be close to her and the whole family as they go through this trial together. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we commit ourselves to you as the family of believers that is Hope Church in World's End. We thank you for the many blessings we have received from your hand, for the excellent premises we have here at Segedunum, and for the friendly and cooperative staff with whom we enjoy a good relationship. We thank you for each other and for the way you have equipped us to provide all we need through the gifts of the brothers and sisters within our fellowship. Thank you for those who teach us from the Bible so faithfully both on a Sunday and in our midweek groups. We pray for those who give up their time to serve you on the church council Please overrule the appointment of a new church council at the AGM in a few weeks' time. We pray for your blessing on the planned Easter events, asking that visitors may come to hear the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. In your time, Lord, we pray that you would provide a building for us from which we could reach out to the wider community. We thank you for the support we have had from Amy, particularly through the personnel. We pray for Andy Lyons, Lee McMahon and Tim Davis, that you will give them wisdom and energy to look after their local churches while providing support to the churches for which they share responsibility. We pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be spread widely through faithful Bible-believing churches in the Northeast and throughout the country, so that your name may be glorified. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Now let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Margaret, thank you very much indeed, and thank you to Len for that reading, which we'll refer to later on. We start in Matthew's Gospel, where a lot's been happening in chapter 21. As Jesus enters Jerusalem, he comes as God's king, David's son, proclaiming and establishing God's kingdom. And when the true king arrives, then the false rulers must be identified and deposed. We think of lots of examples of regime change from the world, but Jesus isn't organizing an armed rebellion. He's coming to defeat sin and death, to establish a kingdom of forgiven people in relationship with God, and he's condemned those who've been unable to do this, who could never do this, in a series of parables. Firstly, a fruitless fig tree is cursed. Secondly, two sons are contrasted by their obedience, or lack of it, to their father. And as we heard last week, some evil tenants get their comeuppance after killing the owner's son. And Jesus explains to the religious authorities who've been leading fruitless Israel that they are the disobedient son and the evil tenants. And because they trust in themselves, not in God, Jesus tells the authorities that God's kingdom will be taken from them and given instead to those who are fruitful and obedient, trusting in God. In response to this, and ignoring the chance to repent, they set themselves against God's plan and on a collision course with God's cornerstone that we heard about last week. This is Jesus himself. And you remember the word it said? Any who fall against the cornerstone will be crushed. But they have no fear of God who stands before them, just men. So they hold off the plan to arrest Jesus until it's safer for themselves. Today's parable will show their removal from the kingdom that God alone runs taking place. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for dying for all of us who were your enemies. Please help us through your word to know you and to trust you to your glory. Amen. Amen. We're going to be reading Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. The parable of the wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, ill-treated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wearing clothes, friend? Wedding clothes, forgive me. <laughs> the man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The religious authorities have been found fruitless and judged, and the story of the wedding banquet shows that sentence being carried out. Now you might have felt something similar at various weddings, while you waited for a hundred photographs, wondering how come your wedding outfit had shrunk so much since it was last worn, and if any food can actually be worth waiting this long for. 
And this might have felt like a matter of life and death, but it wasn't. Unlike the wedding banquet of Matthew 22, this is life and death. And it shows us who are the king's true subjects and why it matters. Because Jesus explains that the kingdom of heaven is like the grandest wedding feast you could imagine, thrown by a king to celebrate the marriage of his son. And the invited guests are liable to be the rich, the powerful, the creme de la creme. This wedding is a big deal. And my guess is that if any of us had had an invitation to a royal wedding, or even the coronation later this year, you probably would have cleared your diary to attend. There are of our number those who've been to royal events, but I, I'm sure they pitched up on time. Is that right, Pam? <laughs> now, if we look at verses 1 to 6, those invited by the king to this great event didn't respond like that. They'd been given notice that the event was coming, and they'd been told that it was important, but when did the king's servant come, they refused to attend. But this king is patient and persistent, much more so than we might have been, who would probably be delighted if some obscure relative declined to come and we could invite a friend or even save a few quid. But this king is different. So he asks again by his servants, setting out the delights that await his guests to whom he's been very, very generous. But they ignore him at best prioritising their own interests in land or business, and at worst, they kill his servants. Either way, their response is a complete rejection of the king's authority and a great injustice. Now this corresponds to the response of God's leaders, God's people to those he sent, including the prophets and soon to be his son Jesus. It's the same pattern as we saw with the tenants repeated again in the wedding. Rejecting God, rejecting his authority. So not surprisingly in verses 7 to 10, the king is rightly enraged and rejects these guests. In fact, he destroys them. And he sends out his servants to invite any who will come, both good and bad. The hall is filled. So the elite who reject the king's rule and prefer their own interests are judged and destroyed. And those shown not to have been, they're shown not to have been his true subjects at all. Rather, in come those from the hoi polloi, those willing to accept the invitation. I'm going to read again verses 11 to 13. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a problem. But before we go into this, please remember that we're reading a parable about the right way to live under God's or our own rule. Is, the answer is God's. And you may be somewhat surprised and disappointed to learn that this isn't going to be the good church dress guide. Now, I'm not saying that dress doesn't matter at all. I can illustrate this from my own experience. A couple of years ago, I went cycling up to Berwick with a friend and was rather caught out by my dress because it's fair to say that my friend had prepared for comfort he was carrying all the Indian snacks, but I was dressed for speed and I packed light, very light. Now, this seemed like an act of unprecedented genius as I waited from the top of every hill, but we weren't roughing it, as hinted at by the three stone of Indian snacks we were carrying. And when we went to eat out that evening, the chosen venue was a smart hotel, and I was wearing a t-shirt, shorts and sandals. Now, my friend very generously eased my embarrassment by kindly announcing to the assembled lounge on my behalf that he apologised that I hadn't received the dress code, which from a look around seemed to be jacket and tie. It's true, we ate well but briefly. 
But the problem in verse 11 is much more serious than social death. This man has turned up in response to the over invitation given by the king, but he hasn't taken it seriously. His thoughts might have been, no, you can take me as you find me. I'm good enough as I am. But the king asks why he is there without having bothered to change. And the man has no answer, no excuse. So he's judged and he's cast out into the darkness. And the religious authorities here are in trouble because they claim to belong to God's people. But they were his subjects in name only, actively opposing his rule when it clashed with their worldly status and power. And the warning to the man who's invited into the wedding and doesn't change, accepting the free meal but not the king's authority, carries the same message to those who hear the invitation that Jesus offers. Because it's perfectly possible for us to hear Jesus' word, in other words, to be invited, but not to trust, not to be saved, not to be chosen. And sadly, another parallel well known to us, the sower, confirms this. This story from Matthew 13 shows that not every seed will produce a crop. In fact, of the five categories of seed being described, only one stays the course, producing a rich harvest. So what am I saying? Are we saved by our works? Absolutely not. Or does this mean that grace only applies for coming to know Jesus and then you're on your own sorting yourself out? Absolutely not. But God's true subjects are those he chooses to save by the faith they are given. Through this, they are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus by his work on the cross. This is the change in status that Lindsay mentioned earlier on. All this is grace, every bit of it. None of it is merited, but sadly, we all know those who seem to have been invited, I certainly do, but now seem to be spiritually nowhere, worse than nowhere actually, set at odds with God and with his rescue plan. And they, like us, must enter God's kingdom on his terms, or not at all, for he is the Lord. Now the word that's used in verse 14 for the chosen or elect is the word that Jesus used in Matthew for the new people of Israel, for God's true subjects. It is they who will be kept until Jesus returns, as we heard about in Matthew 24 before Christmas, and for the marriage that will take place, which Len read about to us earlier. And this wedding from Revelation 21, that's not a parable. It's the culmination of God's kingdom. There's a magnificent building, but did you notice it was devoid of a temple because God the Father lives there with his people. They are the temple, and they are described as the wife of his son, Jesus, because all of them were brought into there through Jesus, through his work on their behalf. These are the king's true subjects, those united with him through faith in Christ. And that is why it matters. They are the true subjects. Why it matters would have been very obvious if we'd read on in Revelation, because it shows us an awful, desperate separation described in the book by C.S. Lewis, The Great Divorce. If we'd read on from verses 6 to 8 in 21, we would have heard he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. 
This message is preparing us, as was the parable, for the certain future for us all when Jesus judges everyone. So how can we end up on God's side? There's one way only, through grace. By no merit of ours, but by accepting and depending on God's work on our behalf. Because without Jesus, God's King, taking the punishment and giving us righteousness, we'd all be separated from God forever. Now if, like me, as you saw a list of various ills there, you're keeping a score sheet of the eight characteristics, meeting condemnation, then you may not have got a full house. The magic arts aren't as popular as they used to be. But if so, well done. But this isn't an all-inclusive list. And you certainly got some. We all did. But the great news is that we've still been called, as were many who saw Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. But greater still is that if we've been given faith and awareness of our own sinfulness, of our desperate need for rescue, and some response in repentance and trust, then we have been chosen. None of us are perfect, but Jesus is. And faith in him alone clothes us in righteousness. This is what Lindsay was talking about before, where we're given his righteousness. It's illustrated in Isaiah 61. A bit of the Bible that proclaims the year of the Lord's favour, where the Lord will come back and put things right. And it uses the same marriage theme. It says there in verse 10, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. The religious authorities are in mercy being told of God's kingdom, created through Jesus, in which they can't enter without him. They can't or won't see this, and are revealed as Matthew progresses to be trusting entirely in themselves and their traditions, not in God at all. And we know that their opposition leads to the cross. They aren't the true subjects at all, and they're separated from the one who gives life, who they condemn to death. How do we apply this to ourselves? Well, if you're here watching the video and you hadn't previously heard about Jesus, God's King, and the invitation that he offers to be part of his kingdom, then you're most welcome. And if there's something that you've heard that doesn't make sense, or if you'd like to find out more, please ask somebody. On the other hand, you might have heard this invitation to the feast and thought, yeah, that's useful, I'll keep it for when I need it, but I'm fine running my life at the moment, thank you very much. You might even be someone who thinks that and goes to church, leads a life that's better than most, and yeah, you'll be all right. The message of this parable is wake up, look again. Because a king has subjects, they don't have customers. Jesus offers a sure and certain hope of entrance to his kingdom. He provides the wedding clothes for those he chooses, giving us his righteousness because we can't have it any other way. You might be thinking, well, I'd do all right, I've got this and that and other, but our best outfit, our righteousness, our best behavior with the wind behind us on a good day is described in Isaiah 64, verse 6. It says there, all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. That's all of us here, everyone we know and love. We have no hope without Jesus. However, if we have been chosen, that is given faith, and cloaked in Jesus' righteousness, then we have been made one of the king's true subjects. It's a huge privilege. None of us deserved it. We didn't then, we don't now. Because, I don't know about you, but we so easily get used to salvation and operate 
as if it made no difference to our day-to-day -day lives, because often it doesn't. We've sort of subcontracted salvation and we carry on with life as normal. For example, I recognize that Jesus' name is above all, but I also know that quite often I feel embarrassed to speak of him. I meet up with someone on a regular basis and he is so more comfortable talking about Jesus and God in the midst of his shop. And I find, well, you know, what about Jesus? But it's absolutely true that there's a mismatch there between what I believe and what I do, and we'll all have those. But we are rescued on God's terms, through grace, for eternity. Not saved by right living, but saved for right living. It's a great news, and it's a great privilege. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for coming to live and die to bring those who trust in you back into relationship with God, moving us from death to life. We praise you for making us your subjects through no merit of our own. Father, we thank you for sending us your spirit, and we ask that you would continue to soften our hard hearts and to help us to obey you better. And finally, Father, we pray for any who even this day may be invited to meet with you. We pray, Lord, that please they may be chosen and that come to saving faith. Amen. Now our final hymn, which I invite you to stand and to sing if you're able, looks ahead to the time when Jesus will return as Lord and Judge to be met with adoration by his subjects and wailing by his opponents. It's a stark vision, but it's a true vision. It's what we've seen in our passage this morning. Let's stand to sing, Though He Comes With Clouds Ascending.
Ja, das hilft. Well, let me finish with um, some words from the end of the letter to the book of Jude, um, verses 24 to 25. Looking forward to that day uh, when the Lord Jesus will return. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority, through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Please stay if you can for a refreshment. Thank you.